Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. Hey, thanks for joining us on the show. Listen, we have a really special show for you today. On today's podcast, we have United States Senator Ted Budd from the great state of North Carolina to talk about his first days in the United States Senate, what he's learned so far, and what he wants to achieve. We'll also talk through some common sense solutions that he believes Congress should take up to help make life more affordable for everyday Americans. Tonight is also President Biden's State of the Union speech, so I'll be sure to ask Senator Bud what he expects to hear from the president. Will the president present solutions that will actually have a positive impact on the American people? We'll see. But so far, from what we've seen coming out of this administration, they have not delivered principled policy solutions that would drive down costs and expand opportunities. So there's so much to cover. Let's get right to it. All right. Well, Senator Bud, uh, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time today uh, to, to, to be with us. It's great to be with you. Uh, I appreciate everything that uh, AFP does uh, here in D.C., across our country, and especially in North Carolina. Uh, it's a very powerful organization you have, and I love what you stand for. Well, thank you so much. And you've been a great policy champion for Americans for Prosperity. We really appreciate that. Now, first thing I have to ask you is you're a chicken farmer, right? You know, I don't want to overstate that we're in the kind of the hobby farm right right now, but I did grow up on it's the same farm. It's just ebbed and flowed over the years. It was a holly farms, chicken farm. Uh, it was hatching eggs. So uh, breeders uh, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, up into early 2000s. Uh, that's long gone. But uh, now you can you can count your chickens on uh, just a few of your hands now. OK, but uh yeah, we still have them, but it, I, I did grow up as a chicken farmer. I don't like to say, because, especially if my neighbors are listening, that I'm a farmer because they work way too hard for that title. <laughs> and uh, I have farmed um, and I live in the farming community. All right. Well, but you're not the reason that eggs are costing $12 now. Sure, I hope not. That's a, that's a bad job for a politician if you're doing what uh, evidently Joe Biden has done to a lot of things. You can't blame avian uh, influenza on him, but you can say this, uh, the supply issues, the fuel prices, which lead to high corn prices, which lead to expensive feed, which leads to um, higher egg prices, including um, the labor shortage of disincentivizing people from work. A lot of those things have driven the price up. But uh, um, AI, not artificial intelligence, but avian influenza has been a real problem. They've had to wipe out flocks uh, for uh, for containment purposes. So that's driving a lot of the cost up as well. Well, now, before we get into all the, the issues, and I want to talk to you about State of the Union and what, what we can do sure. to, to help people in America and do things that really are meaningful to them. Every good person who's been around chickens, though, has a good rooster story from when they were a kid. Now, you have to have a good one good rooster story. Well, one story leads to another, and that is as a kid with our neighbors uh, who had a Holly Farms, then became all these became Tyson houses later. Uh, Sally Carter, who was probably my grandmother's age, and she ran two chicken houses. And uh, when a rooster flogged her, I was in there with her one day. She grabbed it by the neck and just with one crank of the hand, like you were cranking an old Model T car, she uh, she wrung that rooster's neck. So it was a problem no more. Uh, years and years later, one uh, tried to flog my youngest daughter. And uh, so I, I, I gave it a lesson from Sally Carter. And um, and then later, you know, you never really want to eat roosters, but we did have a rooster stew that night to prove the point. It wasn't the best stew we've ever made. <laughs> no, but you did prove a point to that rooster. That's we right. did. We did. That and rooster my, would never... My daughter that I was going to look after her. <laughs> That's right. And that rooster would never do that again, right? Wow. <laughs> well, listen... I, I know that you're new to the United States Senate, and uh, I wanted to first find out why you decided to run for, for the United States Senate. You know, I, I, Jeff, I grew up in a family that loves to serve. I mean, it was a service business, janitorial, landscaping in the farming community and that side of our business as well. And um, and we had been around um, a lot of local leaders um, from, a, again, from a local to a statewide to some federal offices. Uh, and when the opportunity came up in 2016, um, I really looked around and said, it's my turn to step up. Not 
to be entitled to an office because you have to work for it. But I really wanted to uh, step up and represent uh, the values which my family and I had lived out for years and just to see if that's what folks wanted for that district. Um, so, uh, you know, 17 people signed up in a primary, five uh, um, five Democrats, 17 Republicans, and uh, just thought I would just go back to work the next w- next day. But uh, evidently, people liked what I had to offer and ended up navigating through it. Well, and you served in the U.S. House of Representatives. This is, you know, what, what were your first couple of weeks, I guess, like in the United States Senate? It's a very different institution than the House, right? It is. Uh, the issues um, seem, you know, more international, obviously, because of the uh, uh, the constitutional role of the Senate. Um, you're more concerned about geopolitical events. Uh, look, I, I'm very appreciative of my time in the U.S. House. It's very important what you do there, especially when it comes to spending. Um, and uh, you, you've got uh, a lot of staffing up that we're doing right now. You know, we've got committee assignments. My committees, while I was on banking, or the the equivalent of banking over there um, in the House Financial Services. Now I'm on armed services with subcommittees of cybersecurity, personnel. If you're concerned about the focus of our military, perhaps a woke military, uh, personnel is huge. Uh, Emerging threats uh, covers our special operations community. Love to give them a support. Very important in North Carolina. Also commerce, um, uh, very um, very aligned with what uh, AFP does. So I'm on commerce, don't know the subcommittees yet, and the health committee, health education, labor, and pension. So, uh, and of course, um, what we all love and where my heart is, and that's with small business. So uh, when Senator Scott called me, I said, I should have asked for more because you gave me everything that I needed to be helpful to North Carolina. <laughs> well, good, good. What, so what would you say are your top priorities in, in this first term in the Senate? You know, they really do uh, align with the committees. We want to make sure that we're sending signals of strength. Uh, Every signal of weakness that Biden has sent around the world, starting back with uh, a chaotic withdrawal. And it's not a debate about whether you're in Afghanistan or not. It's how you leave. And uh, it was demoralizing to us and it sent signals around the world, which have been very costly, um, not just to us as a country, but uh, to others around the world. Um, and I, I just think when you send signals of strength and clarity, you prevent a lot of these things. So we need to get back to that being a, a strong nation um, that uh, that grows our businesses. One of the greatest threats is our our spending. Uh, that we've done to ourselves. We have spent more than we've taken in. We've borrowed from the next generation. So the more fiscally responsible uh, we are now, the stronger we are as a country. Uh, You can't borrow your way into prosperity like we've done. Uh, So I think uh, you have to rein in government spending, uh, which reins in the regulatory overreach that we've seen and allows our country to prosper. And I think ultimately you'll get more tax revenues off of that. I mean, some simply uh, seeing that's the Laffer curve. And I, I truly believe in that, uh, that uh, if you lower taxes, you lower regulation, you're going to unleash the American economy. You know, you, you talked about all the spending and, you know, the reality is that has really put the American people in a tough spot because yeah. we all know inflation is caused by too much government spending. Mm-hmm. And we need to get that reined in. What are your thoughts on on spending where we are now? And as we move forward with a really divided government in some ways, the House of Representatives controlled by the Republicans and, of course, the president that's submitting the budgets. How do we get out of this spending mess we're in? Well, I think of an old quote from a as a new senator, I'll say it. It's what Milton Friedman would have said. Too much money chasing too few goods inevitably leads to inflation. And that's what we have right now, as you've pumped so much money into the economy without the increase in productivity. And so it's too much money chasing those limited goods. A lot of those goods are limited because of uh, the regulatory overreach. So it's a it's a vicious cycle, not a virtuous cycle. And we need to um, stop spending. So I look at this as a brake pedal and a gas pedal. And while I thought I would have a few more colleagues in the U.S. Senate to put us in the majority uh, and have a gas pedal to point us in the right direction um, or accelerate us in the right direction, now we've got to use a brake pedal and to protect the filibuster. We've got to stop a lot of bad ideas that are going to come across um, our desk here in the Senate. Aside from, you know, stopping some of this excessive government spending that's that's caused inflation, what else can Congress do? To, to maybe stop inflation and stop the, you know, the hurt and the pain that that's causing the American people. 
you know, a couple of issues, uh, three main issues I focused on because it's what North Carolinians were telling me when I was out in all 100 counties in North Carolina back on the campaign trail. The first was about inflation. And I didn't link the economy from inflation from spending. I put all those together because they're they're interlinked. Um, and so we got to reduce uh, government spending, which can, you know, would rein in government uh, uh Reigning in government spending would control inflation. The other is support law enforcement, because a lot of this pain that you mentioned, we're only one or two degrees away relationally from somebody that's lost their life, a name uh, that has died because of uh, the, the drug cartels and the open border policies um, and the lack of support for law enforcement. And so that's a lot of heartache there. So I want to make sure that uh, we support our law enforcement. And uh, I think you, you you lead to proper immigration through controlling the border. Um, you want to be pro-immigration. We're only a couple of generations away from probably um, uh, somebody who came uh, to our country as well. And, and the, third you know, thing, the third thing I would say, Jeff, is we need to empower parents to have a say in their kids' education. Uh, parents, and it didn't matter uh, your economic level, it didn't matter your your ethnic background, but parents uh, were really uh, fired up about having a say in their kids' education back in North Carolina. And we want to do everything we can um, to unleash uh, their ability to choose where they want to send their kids to school. Well, yes, it's so true. So many uh, things that you talked about would make such a great difference. And so many states now doing uh, education savings accounts and doing great things that will help bring free market solutions to education. Um, on the issue of inflation, one of the things we're seeing is is energy costs, right? The rise, the rising energy costs. And that is also contributing to inflation. What can we do in that area? Yeah, when you see uh, what what Biden has done um, with the overregulation, you see what he did with um, um, their, you know the first week in office, he canceled the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, he stopped oil and gas production in Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico. And during his first two years in office, Biden leased the, the fewest acres of federal land for energy production since the Second World War. Um, uh, you know, almost eighty years ago, um, he's he's crushing American energy producers with billions of, fa- of, uh, of fees. And, uh, you know, now he's forced us to go talk to Venezuela and Iran and, yes, even Russia for oil. So it's completely backwards what he's done. Uh, if you want clean energy, uh, and I'm talking about uh the fossil fuels that are the cleanest as far as production uh, and the lowest cost to produce. Uh, I really think you need to start looking here for more energy exploration here in the U.S. It's great for American, uh, not just energy and driving costs down at the pump um, and uh, and heating oil in the Northeast. I think it also produces a lot of American jobs uh, that are resilient jobs. And we need to make sure to focus on that. And everything Biden has done has been completely backwards from that. So I know we've just got a couple of minutes left. I wanted to ask you the State of the Union address is tonight, and um, I'm, I'm sure that that it's all a buzz over at the Capitol about that. What, what are you expecting from President Biden tonight in the State of the Union address? Look, this is teeing it up for what he has said about him running for re-election in 2024. So it has to be a massive change of subject for him. Uh, he has to take uh, the Americans' eyes, uh, a sleight of hand, if you will, has to take them off the pain that they've felt under his administration in the last several years. He's choked down jobs. I know you may have had a, a blip in uh, the jobs report recently, um, but they've been very difficult. Uh, a lot of those are coming back from COVID. Um Costs are higher at the pump, costs are higher at the grocery store. There's fewer selections, uh, more overreach. Everything he's going to have to do tonight is about taking uh, people's eyes off of the pain and focusing on spending and trying to cast a vision for the future, which whatever he's said he would do, he hasn't done. Um, And it's just been a very big disconnect from what he promised in 2020. So what are the alternatives? I guess I'll I'll ask kind of as the final question, what are the alternatives then to what you think the president's going to are going to propose tonight? Well, you need to be pro-American energy. You need to be pro-strength. And it's not just what he says, it's what he does. I mean, when you when you project American weakness, whether it's in Afghanistan and the, the chaotic withdrawal in August of 2021, uh, which has led to so many very expensive, very costly uh, wars around and saber rattling around the world. Um, again, you've got to be strong and, uh, and I just don't think he projects that. So again, I would project strength and a lot of what you do is not just what you do around the world, 
is you have to be uh, pro-American energy, not just clean energy. That's, you know, I'm for all of the above, but you have to be about petroleum exploration here in the U.S., um, not just the lower 48, but also in Alaska. Um, and we can do it in an environmentally responsible way uh, that's pro-job and pro-energy and lowers the cost to American consumers. Um, amazing. Senator Ted Budd, thanks. You, what a great policy champion you've been for Americans for Prosperity, but really for the American people. I want to thank you for all the work that you're putting in to, to help make people's lives better across America. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to keep it up. Appreciate all you do. Looking forward to working together over the next six years. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. God bless. Well, it's always great to highlight a policy champion like United States Senator Ted Budd. And I really appreciate Senator Budd joining us. If you'd like to get connected with an Americans for Prosperity state chapter, be sure to email me at jeff at AmericanPotential.com. Now, the American Potential podcast is always working on stories to help keep you informed as well as inspired. And we'd love for you to stay connected by liking and subscribing our channel. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you know of a great story of someone that's working on expanding freedom like Senator Bud, or just an everyday American, a neighbor of yours, anyone trying to expand freedom of opportunity that, that we should share, be sure to go to our website, AmericanPotential.com, and be sure to fill out our Share Your Story section. Hey, thanks for joining us on American Potential. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.